Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Scribble Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 43 of Project Odyssey, in which we are going to launch the module that we had at the end of the last episode that was sort of blowing up the launch pad. Well, it was still blowing up the launch pad, but I decided that I didn't care. We don't need a solid launch pad. We can launch off of the sand for all I care. We have our special Kerbal engineers on the job, and they can launch from pretty much anything. There was a second problem we were having though and that's that I couldn't get it out of the normal physical acceleration time if I were to hit the period button in order to speed things up it was just going to go up to plus two three four and usually when I do something like that at the launch pad the whole thing starts to shake so much that it explodes Every now and then, a craft will just do a lot of shaking like that and with no idea exactly why. Uh, oftentimes, it can be because you have a gyroscope that has too much power relative to the craft, and so it's constantly overcorrecting, trying to line things up. Other times, it can be because two parts are interpenetrating each other, and when that happens, it's trying to shift them apart. And the shifting apart process can cause the whole thing to become unstable and shake until it explodes. But in any case, it all ends up meaning we can't go into regular warp, which means we can't warp until the Copernicus is coming over the launch site like we would normally want to do. So because of that, we're just going to launch right now as we've done. And once we get up there, then we can correct our orbit to go and intercept with the Copernicus and just hope that we're online for it and that it won't be too many times around orbiting before we can go and rendezvous and then dock up this new module. That was the plan, but then when we actually got into orbit, well, we aren't even in orbit yet. We're still suborbital, but we were able to find a way to get a close approach. So here we are, adjusting the orbit to bring that ascending node over to the close approach markers meaning that right at the point where we're going to be the closest is also the point where we're crossing the orbit of our target making it extremely easy to intercept us a few minutes later our payload was in position and ready for us to decouple that injection stage leaving that payload spinning along although we get the advantage of the automatic stopping of the spinning whenever we have to fast forward since in this installation i'm not using that mod that keeps things spinning even during higher warps after that, you know the drill. We're going to go and get our space tug and go over and grab onto the module on our special radial docking port with the stack separator that can pull that thing off later. Grab it and bring it back to the Copernicus, at which point we're going to have three of the non-unique modules docked up. I guess that's six at that point. We'll have six, six modules. Ha, ha, ha. Now here is another demonstration of why I love that Navy fish docking alignment indicator. In combination with my close approach distance, when I'm well away from a docking port, I can see exactly where to go. I just line myself up with it in the Navy fish docking window, look over at that flight computer and adjust my trajectory a little bit with the RCS keys, the J, K, I, L, and sometimes a little bit of H and N, shifting right and left as appropriate to get the close approach down to a, as small a number as I can, usually one meter, sometimes two or three meters, but if it's really low, that pretty much means I can take my hands off the keyboard at that point, walk away, come back, whatever it says on the time to close approach distance, minutes and seconds, step up to the computer at that point, and oh, look at that, I'm docked, you know, that kind of thing. Well, sometimes I can do that. In this case, my close approach needs to be a couple meters off because I've used control from here from the docking port that's on the space tug, not on the end of the module. I find that when I use the one on the end of the module, the gyroscopes don't know what to do as their torque value goes through that docking port and gets inverted. That causes the whole thing to kind of shake all over the place, but by doing control from here from the space tug, then the SAS and gyro torque doesn't go through the docking port and it doesn't shake. So I can keep it lined up in that way because both docking ports are on the same Z axis. They're just a few meters apart. So my close approach when it says four meters, it's actually zero. 
Now right here, I am intentionally shaking the station to see if those docking ports are connected. I checked the connections up at the first module, then I went down to the second module that we just docked. There's a tiny visual gap in between on this one, but I think that's just an art glitch because when I went to shake the station, nothing moved around. You're going to see later, I will demonstrate what it looks like when that is not lined up correctly. Now you remember previously I had said that Valentina was going to need to go outside on an EVA to fix all the life support systems, unbolt them and move them to different locations and rebolt them on that life support module because the solar panel was sort of clipping through some of those parts. Well, she has completed that task. She can now activate the solar panel or maybe give the word into Kesla inside and tell him to activate it after checking it out and making sure it's good. And it unfurls and everything is now great. Each of these three modules that is not connected directly to the core is going to have their strut pulled down and attached to the core. So now Valentina does that, followed by kind of flying out a little around to the outside, taking a look in at the craft from out there, checking for any damage, seeing that everything is okay, and then heading back inside where she can slide out of her spacesuit and perhaps go have a snack for a job well done. So now we're down to just missing the communications module, which goes in between the last two core segments, the interplanetary transfer stage, and a crew transport to bring up the rest of the Kerbals that are going to be going. However, before that happens, we have a bunch of robotic automated launches that need to go. This ship is going to stay in orbit around Kerbin for quite a while now, as we run it through lots of tests and simulations well before sending it to Duna. That's just a taste of what we can offer. We have a cure for the dimensional shifting sickness. Really? How can you be sure? Hadfield over there had it and was fully cured by Neil, our medical officer. We gathered a special gas from Jules' upper atmosphere to perfect the cure. We can also inoculate against further sickness. We could share this knowledge with you as well. And all we need to do is share our communications tech with you? That's right. Well, I'll need to talk to my commander. You mean Sergey? That's right. Well, give us your communications tech and we'll contact him. Okay, I see the problem. Fine, but you need to do a few things for me. Name them. Put on more of that music. <laughs> Computer. Resume playlist. What else? Let me have as much of that snack as I want. What did you call it? Popcorn. Yeah, that. Also, I want access to a scanner so I can keep trying to find or contact my ship in orbit above us. Done. Alright then, we have a deal. Commander to operations. On my way. We have an incoming transmission from the alternate dimension. It's Kamalak's ID. It's about time. Put it on. This is Krantz Kerman of the Gateway Command. You're Sergei Kerman, I assume. I am. Well, I'm here with Kamalak, and we have a deal to offer you. I'm listening. Great. We have a lot to cover, so let me just start at the beginning. It was about nine years ago, and we were experimenting. Back at the launch pad, we are ready to send our communications module, but the launch pad was damaged again, and that inability to go into a higher warp than times four means we have to launch right now from our broken pad in the night. The communications module we're sending up also includes our external stowage racks for gear and our airlock that we can go in and out of and stop needing to depressurize the whole station anytime Valentina wants to go out on an EVA. All of the communications that we're bringing up right now are pretty much just for show because remote tech has been giving me issues and I had to temporarily and possibly permanently disable it. But I think it's okay because we have so many links in our network now and that gigantic network of satellites around Duna and 
the deep space communication relays. So I find it hard to believe that anything, anywhere, at any time could be out of line of sight of something that I have sent up. And I am going to continue pretending that it's working, making sure that I have all the right links in all the right places just in case it does get turned back on because if I can find what's wrong with it then I will activate it and I'll need everything functioning correctly when that happens. You can see that we just set up our maneuver to do our close approach and the burn is underway. In fact the burn is pretty much done. Just one loop around and then we'll be there. But notice how far apart those two orbits are. At that close approach, I'm going to be going relatively fast compared to the Copernicus that we're matching up with. So that means I'm going to do an extra burn as we're getting close to it to just reduce that relative velocity that the two of us are going to have. Otherwise, it's going to show up and we'll be zipping past it at 400 meters per second. And you know how when it switches into that vessel loaded mode, Mode from unloaded state which causes the physics to start reacting and things slow down around that 2.4 kilometers from your target well if we're going 400 500 meters per second relatively when we hit that point it's going to be too hard to control so that was why I wanted to make sure that we reduced that before we got there all right we successfully opened that fairing even though it seemed to be scraping against the payload a little bit I should have used some of those retro boosters up in the fairing to force it away without being able to touch it but we were okay and now it's time for the space tug one more time we keep on redocking and refueling the space tug in between missions and it has done a lot of work i think it's had more jobs here with the copernicus than it ever had with odyssey station our payload is continuing to drift away after the force of the decoupler gave it a little extra velocity there so we're going to have to chase it down before it gets away we'll speed time up quite a bit here because it took a couple minutes to get over there we of course lined ourselves up first and then maneuvered over toward it. That way the docking ports would just sort of slip into place once we got there. You can see up on top of the module, we have our very long range communications antenna. It's a big, huge dish, but it's not opened yet. And then here on the bottom, you can see those stowage racks with the cargo. We have those reversible stowable engines that we'll use to maneuver over there now since we were so far away after that decoupler kicked this payload out there. Let's see, another thing you can see on the bottom there is the airlock and a support beam that's going to be used in order to put our strut across from one to the other. You can also see the antenna that we're going to use for shorter range communication, making sure that when we get to Duna we can talk to everything around there. And up on the top of it, right around the big dish, there are four control moment gyroscopes that we'll use for stability. Once the space tug is no longer providing the stability from its large gyroscope that helps it maneuver around. Now so far the docking for the other two modules has been so smooth that I didn't get a chance to show the rotator that's underneath the docking port. So this time we're going to come in intentionally askew by docking it so that only one docking port is lined up. That'll allow me to show off how the rotor could have fixed things had we come in off center on any of these three launches accidentally. You might think that it would actually be easier to do it this way if I only have to line up one of them and then just rotate it into position for the other one. Oh hey look, we're having us a, um, a lunar eclipse. Although that happens once every single revolution of the moon uh, for Kerbin, since it's an equatorial moon. Anyway, we've docked up the one side, and now in the upper right, you can see that I'm tapping on the little button that rotates that whole module until it comes in contact with the other side and docks up. I noticed something floating around, and when I looked over, I realized, oh, that's that stacking decoupler that we had the space tug attached to. There it goes, floating off into space. In fact, I also noticed the space tug going off. At first, I thought I was seeing some orbital debris, but uh, of course I should remember that I just released the stack separator, the space tug, and the docking port that was attached to them, so naturally they're still here. We have a strut to connect, so Valentina is going to run some tests on the airlock, and then if it checks out, we're going to use it. Things look okay, so out she goes. She's gonna grab onto the strut that's right on the end of that brand new module that we just docked. 
and like the two before it, run that down to the core, adding a little extra structural integrity. And then Kesla Inside reports that the new communications dish is not unfurling. Something is wrong, so she needs to go and check it out. She inspects the dish and realizes that it has a fried circuit board, so we're going to have to get a replacement circuit board installed. We'll do that on a second EVA now that she knows what the problem is. For now, let's just head over and finish hooking up that strut. So off she goes with her little EVA pack over there, grabbing onto the strut and then gliding down to the core, hooking it up as easily as she did the other ones. For this job, she's prepared with the appropriate tools. Then after that, she'll glide her way out past the Copernicus, float out there about 50 yards off, look at the whole ship, see if there's anything else she can detect that might be wrong, and then head back inside toward that airlock. We're almost done now. The final module, the transfer stage, isn't going to come up for maybe as much as another year because the transfer stage is liquid hydrogen and we don't want it all boiling off. The transfer stage isn't equipped to keep it freezing at the same time that we're keeping the large center tank freezing. We can only power one of them. Right now we're powering the center one, keeping that cold. Once we've drained that for our trip over to Duna, then we'll drop that and the transfer stage will get the power and all of the coolant that will keep it cold for its long trip. So just a quick look now at the module we docked there. It uses the same construction techniques as a couple of the others where it has that crew section that goes in and connects to this one over here which I used as the root part. Docking ports on the two ends. We have our airlock down there on the bottom. Cargo around the outsides here and a docking port on the side there. Communications dish on the top that we need to get fixed. Valentina is going inside right now to grab another circuit board that we can install and then that will hopefully function and open up properly. And then the whole rest of this is actually one part. If we go over here onto the tab that has all the big modules that I'm using on utility, you can see it right here. Most of this is all the one thing there. See that? You can sort of ghostly, but you can make it out. It has the racks and the antenna and the straight piece there. I think I can put this down on the bottom. So you see there, yeah, the cargo carriers themselves get slotted into there, but I put some nodes in there that would allow me to do that Four nodes here. I can grab one of those and you can see there's two nodes there and two over there, one in the bottom where the airlock goes and one node up on the top where the communications dish goes. But other than that, everything was welded together to reduce my part count right down to the gyroscopes and battery and monopropellant tanks, everything else in there. Next up, we are doing a simulated launch of, as you can see on the screen, it says Hab Rover. It also says water depleted, so that's the first thing that needs to be fixed. Something must have gone wrong in the configuration file and the water is not showing up in the Hab. You can tell it's a simulation because there's crew on board. That's actually the simulation crew. They're in the command center, keeping an eye on things as it goes. You can also tell it's a simulation because it has just exploded. Joseph fed the simulation crew a faulty indicator on the stage and they incorrectly hit the wrong switch, staging away the entire lower section, not just the boosters like they were supposed to. Another thing that they had to fix was strut down those boosters because they were wiggling a little bit on the last takeoff in the sim. And now in this sim, we're seeing some kind of overheating in the fairing, so we'll have to look at the config files again to see what's going on there. And as the boosters separate, they're generating too much heat directly toward the lower core, so they'll have to be angled away from the core to make sure that they don't blow it up as they're released. The rest of the staging test went well though, so they reverted back and started the simulator again, this time thinking that it might be the last simulation before the actual launch. So they launched a UKV up and fed it some sensor data to make it believe that it was watching a real launch. You can see that it's off there in the distance believing that it's looking back at the launch pad. As it turns out though, a couple things were still not quite right. One, there was a loss of control during ascent and two, the simulator volume was set a little too high and the sim crew was complaining that it was too loud. 
So now that all of the kinks are theoretically worked out of the system, it is time to launch the Real Hab Rover. By the name, you can sort of tell what this one is going to do. It's the Habitat module. It's quite large. And it's where our ground crew is going to spend most of their time. And it's also a rover, which means it's on some special tread-like wheels that are very similar to the Curiosity rover, but they're gigantic. These will be used to position all of the modules once we get to Duna. If they happen to land a few hundred meters apart, we'll be able to roll them into place easier this way, since we were having some troubles with the Infernal Robotics and docking ports last time, moving everything around using that robotic docking rover up on the moon here at Kerbin. That's exactly why we do these reference missions, to make sure that we know that this stuff is all going to work when we get to Duna, where it really needs to count. And what perfect timing, talking about reliability when we have a booster decoupler failure on our launch. While we're going to keep going up anyway, the dry mass of those boosters isn't necessarily that bad. The Delta V budget has a little left over. We should be able to carry those up with us and decouple those when the whole core goes. The second set of boosters did decouple properly, so hopefully that will be our one nasty glitch for this mission. And as the core drops away, and the solar panels come out and the communications dish is expanded, I need to explain what's going to happen between this episode and the next one. I have a whole bunch of launches to put up, lots of different ships, and none of them are going to be very interesting until they actually get to Duna, where you can see what they are and see what they do. So rather than showing all of the launches, and it's a lot of them, We'll be skipping ahead next episode to the point where we're departing Kerbin with our whole fleet. Once they all get to Duna, then you'll get to see what's inside. Trust me, as far as the launches, you're not going to be missing anything. It's rocket goes up, followed by rocket goes up. Repeat, repeat. A few of them even are two launches because we have to send the payload and the transfer stage separately. We'll see all of that next time on Project Odyssey. Until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.